Okay. Now uh, we are going to talk about uh, hoarseness, and uh, as you know, uh, how do uh, we produce our voice? Voice, as you know, is produced in the uh, larynx, which is formed in words by the tongue. And so these are the two important uh, organs in our body, which produce the voice. Now there are various type of voice, as you know, the uh, tone of the voice is a uh, uh, lot of things plays an uh, important role uh, to produce a tone of the voice, soft palate and sinuses. As you, some of you may have noticed that when you have got a cold or block a stuffy nose, your uh, tone of the voice changes and becomes thick. Or if somebody has got a cleft palate or paralysis of palate, they have got a nasal voice because there's a leakage of uh, air to through the nose. So th this is how the voice is produced, so uh, tongue uh, take parts in producing the words. For example, if somebody has got a, a tumor in the tongue, or, uh, so the voice will not be hoarse, but there will be dysarthria, or somebody who had a stroke, or some neurological problem when there is a paralysis of 12th now, then there will be dysarthria. So often people with a stroke or neurological disorder do not have hoarseness, but they have this, this arthria. So these are the important uh, structures which uh, help in producing the voice. Now, what do you mean by a change in the voice? Hoarseness is either harsh voice or rough voice. I'm sure you, might, all of you or most of you have, have had hoarseness of voice. Uh, uh, at some stage of uh, life, uh, for example, after girls uh, who are singing in, during the weddings or the boys uh, uh, who are active in politics and are uh, giving speeches. So now voice can be different type of voice, hoarseness or a nasal voice, voice which I just told you about, cleft palate or soft palate paralysis or thick voice as in sinusitis or inarticulate speech or dysarthria uh, with the disorder of the tongue or neuro neurological. I just told you about that. This, these are just appearing in your slide. All right, next slide. Now, hoarseness could be due to various causes. The commonest cause is inflammation and acute laryngitis. Whenever we are talking about causes, so you, as I told you, you all know that we divide them as congenital or acquired. And acquired uh, starts from trauma, inflammation, new plasma, so, uh, uh, is uh, voice abuse. Uh, people who are involved in their profession to use their voice, for example, teachers, preachers, singers, uh, often suffer from Hoarse voice. Uh, another cause of hoarseness is recurrent lesional palsy, and then comes the trauma. It could be accidental trauma or iatrogenic trauma. For example, when somebody is operating near the recurrent pleural nerve, uh, like thyroid surgery in the neck or in the chest on the left side when uh, doing the bypass surgery or any cardiac surgery. Uh, tumors are another cause of the hoarseness. Uh, benign tumors, uh, malignant tumors. There will be separate lecture next week on tumors of the uh, of the larynx. So we'll discuss in detail. So these are the various causes uh, of the hoarseness, and you must remember these two: inflammation and voice abuse are the most common causes of hoarseness. Other causes are rare causes. Okay. And in the end, this is called functional or muscle tension dysphonia. A lot of young people we uh, come uh, with this sudden on onset of hoarseness after some emotional trauma. And uh, when you look in their uh, larynx, their larynx is mobile. There's no paralysis, but the vocal cords are not uh, coming together. So there is some spasm of the muscle. And often I see. It, a patient with aphonia, they have got no voice, they're just whispering. And 99% of, of them are functional. Uh, uh, the way to differentiate an, uh, real aphonia from the functional aphonia 
is to ask them to cough. When they cough, if there's a voice, voice cough, obviously uh, that means that it is functional because whenever we cough, our vocal cords comes together. So that shows that vocal cords are functioning normally. So these are the uh, various uh, causes of hoarseness. Now, acute laryngitis, as you all know, could be viral or bacterial. In the beginning, patient in the viral laryngitis, there will be no fever, but patient may feel uh, may have a low-grade fever or tiredness or had had a cold, followed by some hoarseness. In bacterial laryngitis, there will be uh, uh, associated with high-grade fever uh, along with the hoarseness. Uh, in the early phases, most of the laryngitis are viral in origin, and in the beginning, you don't have to start with antibiotics. Uh, if this history is very short of uh, 24 to 48 hours, or maybe three or four days, uh, uh, if you examine the larynx, the vocal cord will be obviously hyperemic. In viral, in bacterial laryngitis, they will be very uh, almost red in color and swollen whereas in viral there will be slight hyperemia and the treatment of acute laryngitis is write down on the piece of paper let me see how many of you write the correct answer uh, the most common treatment or the first treatment of any laryngitis is voice rest okay remember that and then comes uh, if there's a pain, analgesic. If you think it is a bacterial laryngitis, then you can give them antibiotic. And a lot of fluids, steam inhalation will help. A gargles, a lot of people take gargles. I do, don't think that gargles with antiseptic is going to help in laryngitis. It will unnecessarily produce and strain your larynx when you are gargling. You produce a, a, a sound. So we do not want to. Uh, uh, you do not want larynx to function at that time. You want complete rest to your voice box. So that means voice rest. Okay. Now then comes, uh, this is uh, one of the video. Uh, I, I, I don't think I can play it here uh, in this presentation. Next, please. Now chronic laryngitis can be specific or specific and can, as I said, voice abuse is the most common, but uh, chronic laryngitis again. And this is, is seen in people who are using excessive voice, as I have earlier mentioned, like uh, teachers or singers. Recurrent respiratory tract infection because of the post-nasal drip, uh, people can, can get into post, uh, uh, although they may not be using, in, they may not be abusing their voice, but uh, Recurrent uh, uh, inflammation of the upper respiratory tract will produce the chronic non specific laryngitis. There are other factors like people who are smokers and exposed to chemical uh, can have laryngitis. Sometimes people who are taking um, inhaler for the asthma, uh, various bronchodilators, inhaler that can also cause irritation of the larynx and their voice is uh, hoarse. Now specific is tuberculosis, which is common in Pakistan. Uh, although tuberculosis is very common in Pakistan, but tuberculosis laryngitis is very rare. I can safely say that in my career of more than 30 years, I have seen only, I have diagnosed with biopsy only two three, or three cases of tuberculosis laryngitis. So for some reason, despite tuberculosis being so common in Pakistan, Tuberculosis laryngitis is rare. Gastrointestinal reflux is a rare cause of laryngitis. For a lot of time, we see people who have got hoarseness. Uh, when we look in the larynx, uh, there may be some thickening of vocal cord, but there is a hyperemia of adenoids. So hyperemia of adenoids is often due to gastrointestinal reflux. So that also produces the uh, chronic laryngitis. So one must not forget about gastrointestinal reflux and chronic laryngitis. Okay, uh, so these are the various causes uh, of chronic laryngitis and uh, non-specific laryngitis. What are the things which we can see? Vocal cord nodule is the commonest thing we see in, pe in people who are uh, 
teachers or singers or preachers or people who are uh, uh, half is the Quran or involved in, uh, are undergoing hips, especially children who are reciting Quran, uh, they come with hoarseness. And when you examine their larynx, you will find the no vocal cord nodule. They are typically bilateral and fine at the junction of anterior and middle one third of the vocal cord. Vocal, the, the color is normal, like pale. They are not red or they are not like polyp. Another cause uh, vocal abuse which can cause is the polyps. Uh, they are usually smooth, sessile, appendiculated. And um, the way to differentiate from tumor is the tumor are usually irregular, rough surface, but they are smooth. So most of the time when you look in, uh, in the larynx, you can safely say that it is a benign polyp. Sometimes vocal cord may be thickened or edematous. There may be a rankish edema, with, which is this submucosal edema of the vocal cord. And the vocal cord appears appear like a, a balloon. I will show you the pictures in a minute. Functional dysphonia, I have, we have just discussed. So these are the various things which we see in chronic laryngitis. In acute laryngitis, you will see the vocal cords pink or red. But in, in chronic, there will be nodules, polyps, uh, edematous vocal cord, or thickened or anchors edema. Tuberculosis, uh, uh, how do you diagnose tuberculosis? It is very difficult. In the books, it says that when you look at the larynx, then it, is, it shows asymmetrical laryngitis. That means uh, in chronic laryngitis, usually both vocal cords are involved. Uh, like uh, uh, symmetrically, uh, the both vocal cords will be thickened, swollen, or uh, debated. But in tuberculosis, they're usually unilateral, irregular vocal cord or false cord. How you, do you differentiate from malignancy? Is, is the chronic history. Obviously, somebody who has got a malignant tumor will give you a history of few uh, few weeks or maybe few months. But tuberculosis, uh, laryngitis, there will be uh, chronic history of, uh, of more than few months. And uh, if you take the history, it is not necessary that they are suffering from pulmonary tuberculosis. So their chest may be normal. They will have cough or low grade fever. So you have to take the history carefully. Uh, Sometimes it is difficult to differentiate between malignancy and tuberculosis if the history of tuberculosis is short, like three months. And you look in the larynx and see, uh, that the epiglottis is irregular or rough or unilateral vocal cord is irregular. So you do not know whether it is malignancy or a tuberculosis. So obviously what you do, how do you diagnose it? And any suggestion? Uh, I can't ask you in this uh, Zoom meet, uh, lecture, unfortunately. So obviously you do a biopsy. So in, as a general rule, anybody who has got a hoarseness which is not settling down in four to six weeks, and if you see some abnormalities in vocal cords, uh, then you must take a biopsy. Okay, next please. Uh, these are the various pictures which I am showing you. you uh, this is the uh, right vocal cord, this is left vocal cord, and you can see the both vocal cords. Uh, uh, nodules. Okay, this is the picture of direct laryngoscopy. This is left, this is right. Okay. Another picture, you can see this polyp, it is smooth and there's a little pedicle. It does not lo look rough, it is most likely benign. Uh, there's another picture of a uh, smooth polyp, sessile polyp. Now you can see these both vocal cord looks very swollen and hyperemic, and this is chronic non-specific laryngitis. Okay, this is the picture of uh, Renke's edema. Both vocal cord looks like a balloon; they are pale, and there is an edema in the submucosal region. And the treatment uh, of Renke's edema is very simple. Obviously, they will. It, it is a chronic problem. It will not settle down with voice comes out from both vocal cords and the voice gets improved. So you have to take uh, take them to theater. This another pictures of uh, Renke's edema. 
Now, if you look at this uh, picture, this is vocal cord. We are doing a, a direct laryngoscopy. So this is left vocal cord. This is right vocal cord. This is the posterior part. Uh, and near the arytenoid, there are two polyps. This is called interarytenoid or intubation granuloma. And this is often the result of uh, intubation. If somebody has been under general anesthesia and the intubation was not gentle, then after a few weeks, they will complain of hoarseness because of the development of these uh, polypodal structures like granuloma. Now, there's an another condition which is called juvenile laryngeal papillomatosis. As the name suggests, juvenile means young or children. So it, it is a chronic problem. It is one of the causes of chronic laryngitis. Uh, causes viral human papilloma virus is involved in these juvenile laryngeal papillomatosis. It is commonly seen in children and it can involve larynx and even trachea. So that is why sometimes not only children come with horses, but also with the strider. Now, when when the child comes with the strider, obviously you have to um, secure the airway depending on the severity of the strider. Uh, I will give you the lecture on the strider uh, after a couple of weeks. So we will talk about it in detail. Uh, uh, in children, when there is a strider, uh, you have to manage them very carefully, assess them. However, if, you, if the diagnosis is juvenile laryngeal papillomatosis, then avoid tracheostomy in, in, in children, in, in juvenile laryngeal papillomatosis. The problem with laryngeal papillomatosis is, is, is recurrence. Uh, the treatment is obviously surgical and the general anesthesia and micro laryngoscopy will remove the uh, papillomas by the micro debrider or laser, uh, but they often tend to recover. Uh, recur. Uh, as I said in the beginning, uh, at all costs, we must try to avoid tracheostomy. If the uh, saturation is falling down, then they should be intubated. The problem with tracheostomy, if you do a tracheostomy, then there are chances of forming of papillomas at the site of the tracheostomy. And uh, it, is it would be difficult to treat them. So uh, if somebody asks you, a child comes with uh, juvenile laryngeal papilloma and a strider, what do you do? You assess the uh, 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 child uh, general condition, uh, respiratory rate, any uh, any cyanosis, uh, uh, and if the child is obviously looks cyanose or uh, strider severe enough that uh, the child looks tired, then you obviously do arrange emergency admission and intubation. So avoid tracheostomy. A, if possible, occasionally the child is the strat is so severe that and the, uh, there are so many papillomatous papillomas around the larynx that uh, it is uh, often it is occasionally impossible to intubate them. So then we have to do tracheostomy. But the uh, take home message in juvenile papillomatosis is they are recurrent problem and we should avoid tracheostomy if possible. This is a picture of laryngeal papillomatosis. You can see multiple polyps involving the both vocal cords. Okay, so how does the chronic laryngitis pre uh, uh, present clinically? As we have just discussed, hoarseness for more than three weeks is, uh, by definition, is chronic. Uh, usually, it is associated with no pain. Uh, there may be a little bit of cough. You take the history of smoking, and you ask the, the most important thing in chronic laryngitis history is when it comes patient comes with the history of hoarseness for a few weeks or few months so what is the most common question you should ask is their occupation okay so there may be teachers preachers singers so voice abuse history must be asked and as I, sh I have shown you different pictures different appearance that there may be nodules vocal cord thick in edimeters or polyps okay the treatment of chronic laryngitis is usually non-specific uh, voice rest. However, if you see a vocal cord nodule or polyp, then you have to remove them. Uh, if the vocal cord looks thickened, then again, the voice rest is speech therapy. 
So if there is a vocal cord nodule or a polyp, then you have to uh, do surgery in rest of the cases when vocal cords are edematous and thickened uh, after proper history and examination, then you advise voice rest and speech therapy and uh, review them after four to eight weeks. So as I said, micro surgery is done in the cases of vocal cord nodule or polyps, okay, most of the times. And we used various methods, uh, micro divider and laser is the preferred method. But often uh, conventional method, we can easily remove these vocal cord nodule uh, and polyp without damaging the vocal cord. All right. So I think the uh, results are equal, whether you do it with conventional or micro divider with laser. If you're doing conventional, then you should be experienced enough. Of course, the experience is also required for micro debrider and laser. Because when you're removing these polyps on the you should not damage the underlying vocal cord mucosa. That is important. You can see the edema, as I said in the beginning, uh, in, uh, that when the, whenever there's a rectus edema, it will not settle with voice rest. You, you have to do a micro laryngoscopy and make a small incision on the edge of the vocal cord, and the fluid comes out and the edema settles, settles down. Okay, recurrent laryngeal nerve palsy. So we have talked about inflammation, acute laryngitis, chronic laryngitis, non-specific and specific. Now the uh, often patient comes with the hoarseness where you examine the larynx and you find notice that the uh, vocal cord is paralyzed right or left side. So there are separate causes of right and left uh, side. So, but first of all, I will just show you the common causes of Recurrent laryngeal nerve palsy. As you can imagine, trauma would be the one of the causes. But the commonest cause on the left side is CA bronchus. Okay. And then CA carcinoma of esophagus because the recurrent laryngeal nerve is going between the trachea and esophagus. So whenever we see the recurrent laryngeal nerve palsy, especially when it is on the left side, so you must consider CA bronchus or CA esophagus. Esophagus is also slightly towards the left side. So often in the CA esophagus, it is the left vocal cord which is paralyzed. Carcinoma of thyroid uh, occasionally can present with uh, vocal cord palsy, uh, but not always. Uh, if you see a thyroid nodule, it may be benign or it may be malignant. Most of the time, uh, most commonly benign thyroid nodule do not present with Hoarseness or recurrent laryngeal nerve palsy. Let me repeat. Most of the carcinoma of thyroid do not present with recurrent laryngeal nerve palsy or hoarseness. However, if you see a thyroid nodule and there is a vocal cord palsy, uh, there is a hoarseness, and you examine the larynx and there is a vocal cord paralyzed, and it is it is most likely 99.99 percent it is going to be malignant thyroid. But most of the malignant thyroid nodule do not present with vocal cord palsy. Okay, so trauma, obviously any trauma to the neck or on the left side chest will cause the recurrent laryngeal nerve palsy. It is a rare cause, uh, but uh, we have seen few cases of uh, accidental trauma to the neck, like bullet injuries, which can come, uh, uh, damage the larynx or even the nerve. Uh, the itrogenic trauma means uh, surgeon can cause uh, uh, paralysis of the recurrent laryngeal nerve which could be seen in patient who had thyroid surgery. If the surgeon is not careful, then it, he or she may damage the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Or after, so occasionally I've seen patients who had a cabbage or some uh, chest surgery, so they present with left recurrent laryngeal nerve palsy. CL larynx or hypopharynx can also present with uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve palsy. Idiopathic viral tuberculosis. These uh, three are rare causes. So most common cause of recurrent legend of palsy on the left side is CA bronchus and CA esophagus. Other causes are, uh, as you can see on this list. Okay, next, next. Uh, or the stroke, central causes. Somebody had a stroke, uh, may have hostess because of the uh, upper motor neuron uh, problem. Now, right recurrent laryngeal nerve palsy, uh, again, it's repetition trauma, accidental or cervical, itrogenic thyroid surgery, 
or on the right side, obviously, the, uh, there's a difference in the course of the recurrent lesional nerve. On the right side, the recurrent lesional nerve do not go into the chest. So, uh, so if there's a right focal cord paralysis, then obviously uh, it is the cause is only in the neck. If it is on the left side, so the causes could be in the neck or in the chest. So be careful when there's a question, uh, if there's an MCQ and somebody is asking about right recurrent lesional nerve palsy, some students write down the CA bronchus. So CA bronchus would be causing the left recurrent nerve palsy, not the right. Okay, so these are the common causes of uh, right recurrent lesional nerve palsy. Uh, if just uh, if you the easiest way to remember is that uh, the nerve on the right side uh, descends from the base of the skull to the neck between the trachea and esophagus, and then loop around the sub uh, right subclavian artery and goes up again. So it does not go into the chest. So the, all the causes would be either in the in the neck or maybe if there is a, a some problem, some lesion in the apex of the uh, lung that can cause the right recurrent lesion of palsy. But most of the time. Right recurrent lesion of palsy due to the causes in the neck, which could be traumatic trauma or malignancies of the thyroid or larynx. Okay, now left recurrent lesion of palsy causes same as right plus left thoracic injury, which could be iatrogenic or accidental, like esophagectomy, thoracic surgery, or bypass, CA bronchus and CA esophagus or medicinal masses. So. The causes of, of recurrent nerve palsy would be all which I mentioned on the right side, that is the trauma to the neck or uh, accidental trauma to the neck, like uh, neck injuries or iatrogenic, like uh, thyroid surgery or uh, CA larynx or pharynx. Uh, hypopharynx can cause uh, right recurrent lesional nerve palsy, but on the left side it would be same causes as on the right side plus the left side, like thoracic injury or esophagectomy thoracic surgery, which include uh, any surgery including bypass, CA bronchus, CA esophagus. I hope you all, all are not bored because there is no interaction in these Zoom lectures. So I also do not like this lecture, but because of this uh, pandemic, we, we are forced to give you this lecture. So please uh, pay attention. How come there are 101 participants? I thought there's a class of 100, so I don't know. Okay, even cardiomegaly, sometimes can present with the uh, uh, left recurrent lesion of palsy, which is obviously is a benign condition, but it can cause, I have seen, one or two cases. Now, the treatment of recurrent lesion of palsy is obviously treat the underlying cause. All right. If it is neurological or traumatic, there is a stroke. So you give uh, you refer them to the speech therapy department. Okay. And if it does not settle in six months, then we do a surgery which is called medialization of, of vocal cord because vocal cord is lateralized. So by surgery we move the vocal cord medially so that the contralateral side comes and meet in uh, closer and both vocal cords are in contact when the person is speaking. Okay, this is called thyroplasty or we may inject vocal cord with fat or teflon. All right, new plasma bearings we will discuss in the separate lecture. The squamous cell as calcium is the most common malignant cause of the hoarseness. All right, uh, of the neoplasm of the larynx. So if the suspicion of malignancy, uh, benign tumors are rare, but uh, if there's suspicion, this is a commonest cause uh, larynx uh, of the in tumors of the larynx, uh, uh, malignant tumors. Other malignant tumors are rare, adenocarcinoma, sarcoma, there's a long list, we don't have to go. But squamous cell carcinoma is the commonest malignant tumor of the larynx which can cause coarseness. But neoplasm of the larynx, as I said in the beginning, is not the common cause of larynx. However, if a person comes to you with hoarseness for more than four weeks, it is not settling down, and you look in the larynx, if you see a smooth vocal cord, 
take, obviously you don't need to take a biopsy, but if the cord looks rough or there is some growth, so you must, you must take a biopsy. This is a picture of vocal cords. Uh, you can see on this left vocal cord anteriorly, there is a whitish patch, which is leukoplakia, and it is a pre-malignant condition. We did discuss leukoplakia in oral cavity. This is another picture of uh, growth in the right vocal cord. Okay, so hoarseness. Uh, this lecture is quite simple lecture. What you have to think, consider whenever you are talking about hoarseness is various causes. If you know the causes, then you can treat them. Whenever you are taking the history, obviously you all know the uh, history, uh, how to take the history, what is the duration of this hoarseness? Is it constant or intermittent? If somebody's hoarseness is constant, then it means there's some organic problem with the vocal cord, like uh, some polyp or vocal cord nodule or growth or vocal cord palsy. Sometimes patients say that when I wake up in the morning, my voice is normal, but as the days goes by, by the evening, my voice gets hoarse. That means it is due to the abuse of the voice because during the day, the uh, patient is using the voice. At night, you are sleeping at rest. So you may feel better when you wake up in the morning. So if it is intermittent hoarseness, then, then the most likely cause is not is chronic non-specific laryngitis without any polyp or nodule or any growth. So you, uh, these are the questions you ask, which I have just said, and also associated symptom. If you are suspecting malignancy, then tumor of the uh, which are involving the larynx, especially, may go into the hypopharynx or piriform fossa and may present with dysphagia. So ask them about associated symptoms like cough, dysphagia, dyspnea. If the grow, if there is a, a large growth, it can involve the whole of the larynx, and the patient may present with the strider. Okay. So never, never ever forget to ask these these symptoms in patients with the chronic uh, history of hoarseness or prolonged history of hoarseness. Occupation we have discussed smoking or exposure to any chemicals, alcohol, uh, th these are the causes. Uh, smoking can cause non-specific laryngitis. Weight loss and appetite, uh, if there's somebody may have a, a bronchus or see esophagus, uh, then they may present with weight loss and appetite. Uh, tumor, spelling the tumor of the larynx uh, occasionally comes with weight loss, but most of the time they do not not give history of weight loss un unless they have the mass is so big that it is causing dysphagia and they are unable to swallow. So these are the common questions you ask when a patient comes with hoarseness. So do not forget to ask this important symptom, uh, symptom constant intermittent, and it gives you a fair idea uh, about the diagnosis. As I always tell my students that history and clinical examination is the most important part of your, uh, of your uh, patient management. Uh, at the end of the history, your list of deficiencies may be large, maybe you may be thinking of eight, of eight or 10 causes. Then after the clinical examination, the your differential diagnosis list gets narrower. And in some cases, you have to do a few investigations. Uh, uh, investigations are always help, uh, helpful, they, but they will always not give you the diagnosis. It is the history and clinical examination, which in most cases will give you the diagnosis. So examination, as you know, we examine the, uh, first of all, assess the quality of the voice, whether it is the hoarse voice, as I said from the beginning of the lecture, that voice could be hoarse, it could be uh, uh, due to the uh, dysarthria, that is, the, they are not able, the patient will come that uh, say that my voice has changed, and when they speak, the words are not clear. So it is something to do with phonation, not with the phonation, but something to do with the production of the uh, words, which is uh, form, caused by the tongue. So you assess the voice. What is the voice? Is it hoarse? It is uh, uh, due to dysarthria. They cannot pronounce the words, or is it the change in the tone of the voice, like thick voice in chronic in acute sinusitis, or uh, 
voice which uh, uh, we called uh, uh, which we see in patients who have got a cleft palate or uh, paralysis of the soft palate there's a leakage of air through the nose and their their voice is very thin so tone of the voice is changed so whenever you are examining you always assess, also assess the breathing breathing is important when you're suspecting malignant growth of the larynx and it is uh, can uh, it is blocking the upper airway a patient may be struggling and then you examine the larynx by the mirror which is called indirect laryngoscopy when you will come to the clinical posting we will show you how to do indirect laryngoscopy and fibroptic laryngoscopy is quite commonly used in our clinic nowadays we will show you uh, in the meantime you can watch various videos uh, how we do fibroptic laryngoscopy the stroboscopy is something which we do, do not use it routinely i don't think you have to go in detail just a few words about the stroboscopy stroboscope is especially important in patients with chronic laryngitis when you may a vocal cord may appear normal but when you look at the stroboscopy with the stroboscope what does the stroboscope do it slows the movement of the vocal cord so you can see it better with the stroboscopy in patient with chronic laryngitis who have got thick vocal cord all right and always examine the neck in patient who have got hoarseness in case they have got a malignancy and of, of course general examination so so when we examine the uh, larynx we we see look at these things which we have, we have already discussed uh this is the uh, picture of the indirect when indirect laryngoscopy this is the right vocal cord and this is the left vocal cord because patient is sitting in front of you fibroptic laryngoscopy this is a, a endoscope for the larynx and you look uh, because the, you are looking you are sitting in front and you put the scope through the nose in, into the throat and you see this vocal cord so this is will be the left side of the patient this will be the right side of the patient okay so these are you see anterior commissure vocal cords trachea uh, false cord and posterior commissure uh, okay stroboscopy we will just uh, quickly go through it and so you use uh, slow the movement of the vocal cord and then you as it says it uh, you are examining the vocal cord in slow motion so in chronic non specific laryngitis it is useful for the speech therapist to assess the movement of the vo vocal cord and in helps in the speech therapy this is a stroboscope all right but not uh, this is not commonly done we don't have a stroboscope in our department but we we do have fibroptic laryngoscope now so when ever patient come with hoarseness this is first investigation you can call it investigation or a part of the clinical examination or uh, if you are planning an anesthesia then obviously these are the common tests which you do hematological chest x ray if on endoscopy there is suspicions of growth so you do a ct scan of the larynx and then you do a direct laryngoscopy to do a biopsy okay this is a picture of ct scan of the larynx which is showing this growth uh this is the right side this is the left side so the large growth here in the supraglottic region this is the hyoid bone this is the growth so in conclusion uh, it's the most important part if it is if hoarseness for more than one month then you must investigate as i said if you uh, in the vocal cord you see there is some polyp or nodules uh then you remove them so hoarseness history if anybody who has got more than uh, four weeks history then they should come and see the ent doctor a lot of people get hoarseness it may settle down it would it should settle down in two to three weeks but if it is not settling down for more than a month then they should be examined by an ent their larynx should be examined sometimes patient comes to my clinic with the only two days history of hoarseness i don't examine their larynx i suspect that it is hoarseness it is a, a, a most likely